Good evening. I hope you're well and enjoying first year. I'm Galton, a third year medical student. The focus of this evening's lecture is on molecular genetics, specifically DNA replication, transcription and translation. With respect to the syllabus, I would say that it might be worth approaching uh, the molecular genetics topic by grouping the syllabus points into broad processes rather than distinct items, as I've done or attempted to do in this lecture. I'll go through some part A MCQs and pause for you to jump in or write down your answers if you prefer, as this lecture is being recorded. But it's worth noting for this topic, these um, MCQs tend to be relatively basic, and this is really a part B essay topic for the different processes. And if you really nail down this topic, the questions involving this topic can be a real slam dunk in the exam as there's little for the examiners to twist the question or introduce foibles in these topics. So let's start with the uh, very basics. Genes, uh, what are genes? Genes are inherited units of information specifying phenotype at the gross level for morphological characteristics or the molecular level um, coding for RNAs, proteins, etc. In, in terms of DNA structure, um, it's worth going through the basics as well. DNA is composed of nucleotides, a pentose, sugar, phosphate group, and um, nitrogenous base. Um, the nucleotides can be classified as pyrimidines and purines. And I always remember it um, using the mnemonic pure silver. The chemical symbol for silver is AG, so purines include adenine and guanine. Um, a nucleoside has no phosphate group, whereas a nucleotide has up to from one to uh, three phosphate groups. Phosphodiester bonds join the nucleotides, and this is catalyzed by DNA polymerases. The five prime end uh, is a phosphate, and the three prime end is a sugar, corresponding to the location on the carbon ring. DNA is, as you may know, a double helix with two antiparallel um, strands held together by two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine for each nucleotide pairing, and cytosine and guanine have uh, three hydrogen bonds. DNA is present in the nucleus associated with histones, um, that is eta histones to form nucleosomes, and these can condense further into um, chromosomes with linker DNA connecting the nucleosomes. Um, histone modifications are involved in the regulation of DNA expression, and DNA and proteins together um, form a complex called chromatin, and there are both euchromatin and heterochromatin forms where euchromatin is less tightly packed, so it's more actively transcribed, and heterochromatin is less so. The first process we're going to consider is DNA replication. This comes up relatively frequently in MCQs, um, but uh, we'll reserve the most more in-depth steps uh, that we talk about here for essays in uh, Part B. So when does DNA replication occur? Semi-conservative DNA replication occurs during the S phase of the cell cycle, both DNA strands are used as templates, and ultimately the cell produces an identical copy of its genetical inf information. Replication is important for the generation of new genetically identical cells, and this requires various enzymes and proteins that we should go through. Um, it's also worth remembering that fidelity is ensured by a variety of repair mechanisms which allow um, proofreading and error removal, um, which we will also go through. So let's start with helicase. Um, in terms of the role of helicase, firstly, a, um, we must start with the pre-replication complex. And a pre-replication com complex consists of ORC1 to 6, MCM2 to 7, CDT6, and CDT1. And it assembles at the origins of replication during the G1 phase of the cell cycle. There are multiple um, origins in humans, whereas prokaryotes have a single origin. And replication always begins at the um, origins of replication, regardless of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Always try to think about how the cell cycle reg regulates this re DNA replication, as this will boost your understanding of the modulators of um, the replication process. So helicase, uh, when it, uh, in G1 phase, is bound to CDT6 and CDT1, which, occur which stops um, replication occurring kind of like a brake or the handbrake on a car. In S1, there is a reduced uh, expression of CDT6 and CDT1, which is the handbrake. And therefore, this is an example of this control by the cell cycle. In the, following this in the S1 phase, um, specific proteins, um, CDK2 and DDK, re replace, the, um, replace and displace 
the CDT6, um, CDT1 complex and phosphorylate helicase, essentially removing the break from the mechanism. Um, helicase then separates DNA strands at the origins of replication. Um, again, there are multiple in humans um, and form replication forks and replication bubbles. A protein to consider is SSB, uh, which is single strand specific um, binding protein and RPA replication factor, uh, a, that replication protein A in humans, uh, which prevent, they both prevent strands from re-annealing and prevent the hairpin effect. Um, another um, set of enzymes that is uh, particularly important at the top of isomerases one and two, which reduce torsional strain by making transient breaks in one or two um, DNA strands. Um, so following on from this, a nice bit of uh, clinical relevance you can add to your essays is anthracyclines like doxorubicin, our top two inhibitors, and are used in cancer to choose to treat cancer by preventing unwinding and stopping uh, DNA replication and um, preventing hyperproliferation in cancers. So um, now on to uh, specifically semi-conservative DNA replication, the whole process. So uh, one of the uh, first enzymes to consider is DNA prim primase, pol alpha, synthesizes an RNA primer, which is required to begin the replication for both strands. De novo synthesis is impossible by DNA polymerase. The leading strand requires one primer and the lagging strand, we'll cover this uh, precisely the terms later, requires um, primers for each Okazaki fragment. Um, but I said, as I said, we'll cover both of those um, items later in the presentation. A complementary base uh, pairing occurs with three DNTPs. Um, CG, again, forms three hydrogen bonds and AT forms two hydrogen bonds. The DNA polymerase then extends in a five prime to three prime direction. Um, specifically, pol delta is the enzyme for discontinuous synthesis of lagging strands. And pol epsilon is, um, is for continuous synthesis of the leading strand. And they polymerize um, the nucleotides by forming phosphodiester bonds between the DNTPs and ultimately forming a deoxyribose phosphate backbone with each um, new double strand containing one new and one old strand. And therefore this process is known as semi-conservative DNA replication. So in terms of, a, um, of experimental evidence, this section is ripe for experimental evidence to include in your part B essays. A key uh, piece of experimental evidence is the very famous 1958 Messelstone and Stahl experiment uh, proving that semi-conservative replication occurs. So they firstly grew E. coli in a 15 N isotope um, medium. So most of the uh, DNA was 15 N, 15 N. Um, and this was then transferred, the E. coli were then transferred to a 14 N medium and extracted and centrifuged um, for the DNA for the next four generations. And the first generation as shown on the um, schematic um, the original E. coli had 15N, 15N on a single sort of band. Um, the second generation had a band in between 14 and 15. That is a heterogeneous uh, 15N, 14N isotope pairing. And finally, uh, the third generation had uh, a band half, halfway through in the middle um, of 15N and 14N, and also half at um, 14N, uh, 14N. And this proves that there is a semi-conservative replication of DNA because you can track the um, DNA that's been incorporated to see where the original strand sort of ends up as you go through the generations. So there are some more um, critical proteins that are involved in this process. Uh, firstly, PCNA, which is the prolifer pr proliferating cell nuclear antigen clamp, um, requires ATP hydrolysis. And our replication factor C, RFC, is required to tether DNA pole delta to the DNA as there is low affinity between um, the DNA pole delta and, and um, the DNA strand itself. And this uh, removes the need for DNA pole delta to have a high affinity for DNA, which would ultimately slow down replication and increase um, the error rate. This enables greater processivity, fidelity, and speed. And that's really something you should include in an essay when um, describing the process. 
So we can insert some clinical relevance here, um, specifically that strand slippage of DNA pole alpha at a tri-nucleotide repeat can occur, and this rejoins at a sequence upstream, causing a trinucleotide um, repeat expansion, for instance, in Huntington's career, where there is a CAG <coughs> triple repeat expansion. At um, 40 plus um, CAG repeats, Huntington's has full penetrance, and there is an increased penetrance as the number of um, repeats increases below this number. The um, increased number of glutamine uh, residues leads to electron transport chain inhibition, oxidative damage of the DNA, and ultimately the degeneration of neurons, uh, jerky movements, declining cognitive ability, dementia in later life, and dysphagia. The actual specific pa uh, pathway for the neurological co consequences of Huntington's is su summarized on the right. So feel, feel, feel free to consult it in more detail after the lecture. So one thing I would say is always try and include a replication fork diagram in your essays if, you're, if, if it's on um, DNA replication as you have mi mixed mode examinations. Equally, make sure that the diagram itself is reasonably concise and that you can draw it in one to two minutes. So perhaps um, remove some of the details like SSBs and some of the more ancillary uh, enzymes. Um, included on this diagram. So as um, mentioned previously, uh, we'll now cover Okazaki fragments, and there are leading and lagging strands of DNA in replication, and so therefore DNA replication is bidirectional, of course, as it progresses in a five prime to three prime direction, because DNA polymerase can only polymerize in a five prime to three prime direction. So DNA pole um, epsilon is used for continuous uh, replication on the leading strand and DNA pole delta for discontinuous replication to form Okazaki fragments on the epsilon, um, Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand. Again, um, you can use the mnemonic of pole delta for discontinuous, you remember that. And eventually um, during that process on the, um, on the uh, lagging strand, eventually uh, DNA pole delta reaches the next RNA primer um, leading to the displacement of the primer, and this is replaced with DNA, producing RNA flaps, which are cleaved by FEN1, which is flap structure is specific endonuclease 1, and this is then de uh, degraded by RNAs H. DNA ligase is used to join Okazaki fragments, and the experimental evidence for the existence of these Okazaki fragments is that in 1967, um, Sakabi and Ozaki used pulse radio labeled DNA with um, free H thymidine, which would then which would then be incorporated into the new, newly replicated areas of E. coli with their DNA. And they denatured and extracted the DNA following this. And crucially, they observed that a large number of short units of DNA, specifically 1,000 and 2,000, between 1,000 and 2,000 nucleotides long, were present at only one of the strands of the replication fork. Um, this is identical and has been proven again in eukaryotes and these fragments that we see on the lagging strand are referred to as Okazaki fragments. Now we arrive at the terminal step of DNA replication. In eukaryotes um, termination is achieved by replosome collision. In prokaryotes special termination sequences lie opposite to the origin of replication, remember there's only one for prokaryotes, and bind to TUS proteins to block the passage of replosomes. At the ends of the chromosomes, TT, AGG, tandem repeats um, are present thousands of times to protect and prevent the shrinking of the, pro of the end of the cro chromosome. And this prevents end-to-end um, -end fusions, uh, to, uh, forming double strand breaks, um, there is a shelter in pro complex to protect um, from these re re repair mechanisms. And ultimately, because of these telomeres, uh, there is a hay flick limit of 50 to 70 lim um, cell divisions before cells enter senescence. So some cells, um, the relevance of this is some cells um, express telomerase, um, specifically, specifically expressed in stem cells, gametes, and is important in cancer. And during telomere replication, there is a uh, three prime uh, hydroxyl group um, overhang because the lagging strand primer cannot be placed upstream. And therefore, 
telomerase contains a RNA template and reverse transcriptase, TERT, to extend the three prime OH overhang, and then ultimately the telomerase relocates. So this um, enables the replication of telomeres at the ends of the chromosome, as shown in blue. So replication is um, necessarily a high fidelity process um, with, um, with one mistake per 10 to the power of nine. A simple bit of experimental evidence for this is that E. coli with proofreading protein mutants have a dramatically increased rate of mutation, um, really underlying that the uh, replication fidelity processes are critical. This experiment is easy to carry out as E. coli are easy to screen as they divide every 30 minutes. So how is replication fidelity ensured in DNA replication? There are several processes. First, um, correct nucleotides have a higher affinity and then the enzyme and then they exhibit conformational changes so incorrect bases are more likely to dissociate and there are equations defining this in terms of Gibbs free energy and alternatively there is direct repair of damaged slash alkylated um, nucleotides um, clini uh, clinically speaking single nucleotide repair is um, affected in xeroderma pigmentosa the second process is excision by uh, three prime to five prime exoribonuclease domain activity of DNA pole, which excises um, incorrect tautomeric bases. And following this, DNA pole adds in the correct bases, um, for, the, for example, for thymine um, dimerization. The third process is strand uh, directed mismatch repair, where mute S recognizes the wrong base. Mute L and mute H recognize which is the new strand, um, which is hemimethylated and therefore has just been um, sort of replicated. And they remove and excise the section and a polymerase fills in the gap. The clinical relevance for this is that Lynch syndrome, hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer, is caused by a mismatch uh, repair defect. And this confers a high predisposition for certain types of cancer, such as endometrial, ovarian, stomach small intestine, brain, and skin cancer. There's no overall 80% um, overall li lifetime risk with Lynch syndrome. An individual with a single allele only requires one mutation to be able to, uh, to, to be unable to perform mismatch repair, and therefore this increases the um, risk of cancer. The fourth process um, for replication fidelity is non-homologous end joining repair processes, which repair double strand breaks and this process is um, defective in ataxia telling um, uh, The fifth process is homologous recombination, which requires two DNA homologous duplexes, and the damaged strand is repaired using the complementary strand from the double-stranded DNA, and there is no loss of um, nucleotides. Homolo homologous recombination is uh, re repair processes are defective in breast and ovarian cancer with BRCA1 mutations that are associated with the DNA repair complex. It's also defective in Fanconi anemia. So you can sprinkle some of those um, clinical examples into your essays. So now in terms of um, MCQs, here is an example of what a part A MCQ could look like. So um, feel free to um, jump in when I uh, read through the answer, or um, we could just pause and if since it's being recorded, you could write down the uh, uh, answer. So um, uh, what is the direction of DNA synthesis catalyzed by a DNA dependent uh, DNA polymerase? What are the enzymes that can cut um, double strand DNA specific sequences? What is, the what is the direction of um, DNA migration under the standard electrophoretic conditions? Um, what is the name given to autonom autonomously replicating DNA molecules used in standard cloning reactions? What are the enzymes that are uh, called that can join uh, three prime OH and five prime PO ends of existing um, strand, strands of uh, stranded DNA molecules? So I'll just pause for a little bit and um, feel free to jump in. If not, we'll just go through the answers. So firstly, the direction of DNA synthesis is five prime to three prime. Um, in terms of uh, the enzymes that can cut double-stranded DNA specific sequences, these are restriction endonucleases and can be used for um, vector creation. Um, 
in what is the direction of DNA migration? It's towards the cathode as DNA is positive. Um, what is what name is given to autonomously re replicating uh, DNA molecules used in standard cloning reactions? These are plasmid vectors. Um, what are the enzymes called that can uh, join th uh, three prime OHs to five prime phosphates at the end of um, existing double stranded DNA molecules? DNA ligases, and you can sort of uh, see this uh, from the Okazaki fragment um, being joined by DNA ligases in the previous slides. So the next key process we must consider is transcription, which is the process of transcribing mRNA from DNA to then be ultimately translated by um, uh, ribosomes for peptide synthesis. I would like to start by um, pointing out the eukaryotic mechanisms uh, of regulation. Uh, these are definitely useful for some Part B essays, which tend, which sometimes test um, the regulation of um, transcription. Um, so, firstly, the high degree of control required by eukaryotes is implemented by the use of chromatin mod remodeling and the requirement of transcription factors to initiate um, transcription. So general transcription factors, which can be abbreviated to GTFs or TFs, are specific to the required um, RNA polymerase and recognize and bind certain core, conserved core um, promoter sequences to allow for the assembly of um, transcriptional machinery. Specific um, transcription factors are specific to the gene and bind to sequences in the proximal promoter region to exert a finer degree of control over expression than GTFs. Cis regulatory elements, abbreviated as CREs, are, um, are, are regions of non uh, coding DNA which regulate the expression of neighboring genes, including core, proximal, and distal promoter regions. Enhancers are CREs that may be located in a distal promoter, upstream, downstream, or within the gene, which um, upregulates upreg its transcription, typically by binding to um, activated proteins. Silencers are CREs typically located in um, the distal promoter, which suppress um, transcription by binding to repressor proteins, which complex with them. Um, insulators are CREs which prevent the interference of regulation of um, neighboring genes. Locus control regions, L LCRs, are CREs which control um, expression of clusters for distal uh, genes by many mechanisms, including the recruitment of chromatin remodeling, activator enhancing co-activation, transcriptional machinery. Um, yes, yeah, so just a variety of control mechanisms, really. Um, Trans-like regulatory elements um, regulate the expression of faraway genes in contrast to locus control regions, and therefore they code for transcription factors. Some of you might um, rightfully ask, how can I incorporate all these modulatory elements into a Part B essay? And I think the best thing for this would be to draw a quick diagram, such as the one in the slide. Um, this sort of ca ca concisely encapsulates the um, information on eukaryotic cis regulatory elements and make sure your diagrams don't take longer than uh, one to two minutes to draw for the exams. Um, so now moving on to RNA polymerases. RNA in transcription is formed, uh, RNA in transcription is produced by RNA polymerases and the antisense um, strand is the template. The sense strand protects um, nu exposed nucleotides from exoribonuclease activity. Um, the order of the bases in the coding strand is identical to the transcript, um, with the exception of thymine being replaced by uracil. So RNA pole one is recruited by transcription factor one, uh, and it transcribes rRNA, ribosomal RNA. Um, RNA pole two is recruited by transcription factor two, which transcribes um, mRNA and some snRNAs. Um, RNA pole three is recruited by TF3 uh, and transcribes tRNA, some rRNA and some snRNA and other small non-coding RNAs, which are involved in regulations such as um, miRNA. So now onto the first sort of uh, main step in the transcription process. So an RNA polymerase must firstly bind to a core gene promoter. Um, unlike unlike um, 
bacterial RNA polymerase, eukaryotic uh, RNA polymerase requires GTFs, general transcription factors sort of mentioned before and uh, with the cis regulatory elements to associate with the promoter sequence, um, which then recruits the uh, polymerase. And in addition to this, activators and co-activators are required, which bind to regions outside the core promoter elements. And the binding of the transcription factors to the DNA, um, specifically the core promoter sequences, um, must occur. And the TBP subunit of transcription factor 2D binds to the Tata box. Um, transcription factor 2B recognizes BRI. Um, and T transcription factor 2F recruits RNA polymerase 2 and stabilizes the reaction with transcription factor 2D and transcription factor 2B. Um, following this, and transcription factor 2H and 2E 2, and 2 e join, um, the transcription factor 2H subunits um, have both helicase and kinase activity. And essentially after this, the pre-initiation complex is formed, which leads to, um, and this is where the kinase activity comes in, the phosphorylation of RNA polymerase 2's C-terminal domain, um, specifically the serine 5 residue, and this leads to the um, separation of the strands, allowing the transcription uh, to begin. And this starts to transition from initiation to elongation. So maybe note the difference between this and DNA replication, where DNA replication much more has a sort of handbrake mechanism, whereas this has a, more of an initiation mechanism. Um, transcription activated proteins bind the enhanced sequences in DNA, which help to attract RNA pole to the starting point or the initiation point rather, and transcription mediator proteins allow uh, activated proteins to communicate with RNA polymerase 2. And these are tissue specific, so mediators can potentially be clinically useful in targeting specific tissues and regulating their gene expression. So it might be worth exploring that in a part B essay if, if you can. Um, actually, uh, so there are also structures where the transcription factors, RNA pole and DNA strands together are called transcription factories. And this really need, leads us on to some nice um, clinical evidence that you can uh, weave into the essay, uh, by, where Cook et al, 1996, found using pulse um, radio labeled nucleotides were only located in discrete <coughs> sites in the nucleus and rather than everywhere. And these were termed to be um, transcription factors and also antibodies were used uh, for RNA poll 2 and they were coincident, so um, they could also be detected in those locations. So on to the um, next sort of step, uh, elongation. So three activated RNA nucleotides bind the DNA template strand and complementary base pairing occurs. RNA polymerase 2 catalyzes the formation of um, phosphodiester bonds to extend the chain in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And this is driven by the hydrolysis of um, the bonds CTP using CTP, ATP, UTP, or GTP. And ultimately, if an error occurs here, RNA polymerase 2 is able to move back and uh, excise the incorrectly, ex um, incorrectly inserted nucleotide. Um, the clinical relevance of this is trichothiodystrophy is an autosomal recessive disorder caused by um, defects in the genes coding for transcription factors that allow um, the repair of RNA transcripts and the symptoms of trichothiodystrophy include intellectual disability and recurrent infections. So that's possibly something to weave into an essay for that step. Now on to termination. In eukaryotes, um, enzymes cut mRNA after a polyadenylation signal, um, specifically AAUAAA, um, which is then recognized. But in prokaryotic termination, there, is, there are a few more mechanisms. Um, firstly, termination can be due to a row, due to row proteins, which bind up to, um, uh, bind to certain sequences and climb up the mRNA to pull the RNA and DNA apart. If you watch one of those um, the sort of animations that you can find on YouTube, it very much looks like a walking man uh, sort of pulling it apart. Um, secondly, termination can also be row independent. Um, where there's a sort of cytosine and guanine rich area uh, that forms a hairpin as a C and G bind together. And this causes pole to, to stall and the U region, the uracil region afterwards has uh, a weak binding 
to um, the um, adenine on the template DNA, so they essentially separate. So, so far in our story of um, transcription, a pre-mRNA molecule has been produced. However, this, uh, this is, a, is a process of, this is um, sort of the start of the process, but there's also a considerable amount of processing of the pre-mRNA. So we should start with the um, five prime capping, um, that is uh, sort of forming a cap structure around the five prime end of the pre-mRNA that's just been produced um, in the process detailed above. So capping factors firstly uh, join the five prime end of the mRNA. Um, GMP nucleotide is added by guanyl transferase to the five prime end with a five prime to five prime linkage. Uh, guanine is um, in, the, in the GMP is methylated and it binds to a protein complex um, called the cap binding complex or the CBC. And critically, we must consider what is the purpose of this post transcriptional modification. Um, and the answer to that is that uh, five prime capping protects mRNA from five prime um, exoribonucleases breaking down the mRNA and helps with the transport and recognition of the mRNA. Um, and ultimately also facilitates trans um, translation initiation. And this brings us on to uh, polyadenylation. Uh, the signal for um, cleavage and polyadenylation is double A, T, triple A, um, or double A, U, triple A. Um, and it is about uh, 30 base pairs upstream of the site of cleavage or the polyadenylation site. It's worth noting that um, there is a second signal downstream, uh, uh, downstream, which is uh, GT or GU rich. Um, after cleavage, the poly A polymerase adds around 200 to 250 adenosines. Um, note that this does not actually require a template. Um, and the poly A tail is then covered by poly A binding proteins. So what is the um, functional consequence of this um, polyadenylation process? Um, well, a uniform free prime uh, end is produced on all of the mRNAs that have been processed, um, which is actually necessary for a nuclear cytoplasmic export, providing stability and protection from three prime exoribonucleases forming a sort of buffer to protect the original mRNA. Consider how this um, contrasts with um, five prime capping. And this also affects the translatability of the mRNA in terms of a sort of regulatory function in the in the form of alternative polyadenylation, um, where there there is a sort of change in the three prime untranslated region, the three prime UTR, um, that sort of confers a different number of binding sites for the miRNA, which regulates translation and functions as a sort of guide for risks which are RNA induced silencing complexes and it's worth noting that also RNA polymerase 1 and RNA polymerase 3 lack a C-terminal domain tail and so don't contain the necessary enzymes for this um, pre-mRNA processing um, to produce mature mRNA and thus and sort of binding proteins for um, capping and polyadenylation and so therefore, um, this allows um, capping and poly A to be unique traits of mature mRNA that have been processed and therefore um, can be used by ribosomes to recognize uh, mature mRNA. So uh, this brings on, us on to more um, sort of uh, post-transcriptional modifications. So splicing is a process where, uh, where an RNA-regulated transesterification reaction occurs leading to two sequential breakages and the rejoining. So on a basic functional level, splicing leads to the removal of non-coding introns. Um, and the spliceosome itself, it's a complex made of proteins and five snRNAs um, with U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6 forming the core of the spliceosome. It, it is classified as a ribozyme as the um, RNA is a catalytic unit. And I think one of the best ways to understand the splicing mechanism, and also in terms of conveying this in a Part B exam, is um, by drawing a quick diagram, again, 
no more than one or two minutes, such as the one shown on the slide. And the process, and I'll just go through the process, but I think in terms of actually communicating in an exam, that's that's really the way to go for it. So the process is that a um, two prime OH group, with a particular adenosine is in a sequence close to a three prime splice site, as you can see in step one, um, performs a nucleophilic attack on the five prime end, exon ent intron border. And this forms an intron lariat, as you can see on um, the second step. Um, then the three prime OH on the five prime uh, border um, attacks, sorry, the three prime OH on the five prime border attacks the three prime border to release the lariat and intron, which um, is subsequently degraded in the nucleus. Um, and subsequent transesterification reactions fuse uh, the five prime and three prime exons essentially exciting and removing the introns that don't code for um, proteins. So um, on to alternative splicing. So mRNA from a gene can be spliced in many ways to produce a variety of combinations of introns and exons, and hence um, producing many different uh, slight variations of protein products, um, which really has the effect of expanding the proteome much beyond the genome and this is achieved with proteins that hide splice sites, um, so the spliceosome sort of just passes over them, or changing the sites where the pre-mRNA itself is spliced, and enhancer proteins are associated with pre-mRNA, um, leading to more likely, uh, leading to um, an increased probability that splicing factors bind to the splice sites, and therefore increasing the probability of splicing occur at, at the um, splice sites. Cis elements indicate where exactly the spliceosome is splicing. And this can be used to allow tissue-specific gene regulation. Um, for instance, specific proteins um, such as the muscle proteins troponin T and troponin are produced in this way using um, this alternative splicing mechanism. And overall, as well as um, sort of allowing this um, um, tissue-specific regulation, ultimately splicing produces a continued open reading frame, which is required for translation. So in terms of experimental evidence for the splicing process, um, there's, there's one experiment I think um, is quite nice to include in a Part B essay, and that is the 1977 Robertson Sharp experiment um, using adenovirus 2, uh, where the mRNAs were considerably shorter that the mRNAs that were extracted were considerably shorter than DNA, um, and restriction fragments were used to cut the DNA and hybridize and cut, um, was sorry, to cut the DNA and hybridize the DNA that has been cut with the mRNA. And they observed these sort of um, loops of unbound DNA in these hybrids of DNA and mRNA, and these sort of um, unbound loops that sort of look under the microscope like kind of a guitar string that hasn't been clipped. Uh, represents the introns that have um, been spliced. So now in terms of fidelity mechanisms, um, the spliceosome checks and rechecks RNA sequences as sRNAP binds to pre-mRNA. Um, several components of the spliceosome are actually carried in the CDT tail of RNA polymerase 2. Again, remember that that um, gives it the specificity over um, RNA polymerase 1 and 3. And so this indicates when pre-mRNA is ready to be spliced as the sequences containing the splice sites essentially is emerged from the back of the enzyme. Um, <clears throat> so um, another thing to go through is the exon definition hypothesis, where specific proteins such as um, SR proteins, um, they're named SR proteins because they contain many serine and arginine residues, are thought to assemble on exons and um, mark each splice junction uh, to essentially avoiding the existence of cryptic um, sort of hidden junctions that are unable to be bound for splicing. So that's another sort of uh, way of ensuring that um, splicing is very um, regulated. Um, there's another, uh, another thing is of course um, nonsense mediated decay and so where each was sort of each exon has an exon junction complex with proteins attached. And after splicing, if an exon junction complex and EJC 
is present downstream of a stop codon. mRNA is found to be faulty and is degraded. And this essentially is a mechanism of detecting frame shift mutations and sort of um, stopping them. And the clinical relevance of this is seen in um, the effect, seen by gauging the effect of spice sign mutations. For instance, a five but base pair mut um, deletion in the intron of TN and T2, um, specifically a deletion of X intron three leads to exon four being skipped, which leads to um, cardiac hypertrophy, arrhythmias, and increased chance of um, heart failure. So here's an example of what a part A MCQ could look for, like for transcription. Um, so this would be an intrinsic false set. Um, so feel free to write down the answers or even jump in if, if you'd like. And I'll just pause for a little bit so we can go through the answers. Okay, so um, there are specific sequences in messenger RNAs that interact with ribosomes to help them initiate um, translations. Uh, this is true, and this is also true when you think about sort of post-transcriptional modifications um, with um, uh, five prime capping and formation of um, a cap binding complex, which is required for initiation. Um, the carboxy terminal of um, polypeptides is produced first during um, protein synthesis. This is false. Um, because of the um, nature of the ribosomal structure, which we will cover later. Um, mRNA codons are read by ribosomes in a five prime to three prime direction. This is true, um, given the direction of RNA pole, pole two. Chromatin uh, remodeling, i.e. the modification of histones, provides an important level of regulatory control for transcription in eukaryotes. This is true, and there's also a level below that that we've discovered with the um, cis regulatory um, elements. Um, Exons are the non-coding parts of the karyotic uh, um, pre-mRNA. That's false, of course, because that's actually non-coding as introns. So ribosomes comprise um, protein and uh, ribosomal RNA or rRNA components and are synthesized by RNA pole one. So 60S ribosomes contain uh, three uh, ribosomal RNAs and uh, 40S ribosomes contain one a ribosome and RNA. Ribosomes have ribozymes within incorporated within or sort of ribozymal domains where the RNA is catalytic and there are three tRNA sites on 60S, um, on 60S ribosomes. The A site, which is the amino acyl site, the P site, which is the peptidyl site, and e, the E site, which is the exit site, which you can see sort of um, coming off of the AAG there. Oops. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so these are the three sites. A nice bit of experimental evidence from Noller et al. 20, uh, 1992 is that a large um, ribosomal subunit can still form peptide bonds even after 95% of the proteins have been removed or denatured. Um, so no peptide bonds um, are formed after RNAs are added. And further exp experimentation showed that um, 23S uh, RNA can catalyze peptidyl transferase without any protein. Um, so really just emphasizing the ribosomal components of, um, the, sorry, the ribozymal components of ribosomes. Oh, actually, uh, before I'm um, going on to that, I, I forgot to mention, there is a bit of controversy surrounding the three site allosteric model of elongation in um, translation as it's not fully supported by structural studies. And the presence of, uh, presence of an E site is at the exit site that is, is uh, in eukaryotes is actually pretty unclear. So this is more of a sort of classical model. And actually the alpha epsilon model has been proposed and it's um, much better um, supported by experimental data um, this is essentially where there is a single tight alpha epsilon binding domain for two amino acyl tRNAs, leading to a change in ribosomal conformation and subsequently um, translocation. So now we should we shall move on to the role of amino acyl tRNA. Um, so tRNAs are synthesized by RNA pol three. Um, and, is, and it is important that we appreciate the importance of the triplet code because a tRNA with an anti codon binds the mRNA with a codon, 
essentially sort of translating the code into um, the sort of accompanying amino acid. So hydrogen bonds form with two hydrogen bonds as previously between adenosine and thymine or uracil and, and between cytosine and guanine in the A slot of the um, of the ribosome. Um, just yeah, just familiarize yourself with where the A site is, is it's not on this slide. Um, uh, I've also just sort of included uh, the kind of drawn diagram of a charged um, tRNA that you can include in your essays. Um, so uh, that, again, make sure it takes um, less than one or two minutes to draw. Um, amino acyl tRNA synthetase attaches the um, amino acid that's encoded to the correct tRNA. There are only uh, 20 amino acids, but there are 64 different combinations of codons um, which leads to degeneracy, which is a key attribute of this process. A second uh, effect to it I consider is the wobble effect, where the last base can bind to more than one other base, meaning that different codons um, code for the same amino acid. So there's a sort of degree of redundancy there. Um, a nice bit of uh, experimental evidence to include for this process is that Chapville led the, disco led the discovery of um, amino acyl tRNA synthetase, um, showing that tRNA binding to cysteine and it originally was modified to bind to alanine. And this led to um, the binding, the insertion of sort of uh, alanine instead of cysteine when they put those in a sort of pool that was controlled experimentally. And this essentially demonstrated that codon recognition takes place at the level of tRNA uh, with the anticodon and codon and not at the level of amino acids. And therefore, the uh, attaching of amino acids or specific amino acids that have been coded for to the specific tRNA is instrumental to the decoding process. The clinical relevance of this is that MRF syndrome leads to um, defective um, tRNA um, lysine and subsequently an ox uh, ox oxidative phosphorylation protein dis, um, deficiency. And this presents with ragged red fibers, muscle weakness, seizures, um, cerebral ataxia, myopathy, progressive myoclonic epilepsy, twitches, spasms, and dementia. Uh, the clinical treatment for this is um, coenzyme Q10 supplements. And so that's, again, a, a little bit of uh, clinical relevance that you can weave into a part B essay. So we shall now cons cons cover um, initiation uh, of, of translation. So the cap structure and poly A um, tail binding proteins interact, forming a circular mRNA molecule and recruit, um, recruit the ribosome, which then recruits the ribosome to the mRNA. The, um, RNA, the precise mRNA cap structure is actually required for initiation and EIF4E, which is a eukaryotic initiation factor, binds the small ribosomal unit and initiated tRNA is then recruited into the P site. Scanning occurs for the AUG codon in the five prime to three prime direction, um, but this may not occur if the um, first AUG, uh, this may not be the first AUG if the, if the COSAC uh, upstream sequence doesn't fit. So it's not just solely but dependent on the AUG sequence. Um, and EIF3 prevents the binding of um, 60S ribosomes before AUG is formed. And then the um, large 60S um, subunits of the ribosome binds and the eukaryotic initiation factors um, dissociate. In terms of the regulation of this process, 4-EBPs bind to EI4, EIF4E cat proteins and prevent the recruitment of small ribosomal um, <coughs> subunits to mRNA. And 4-EBP phosphorylation prevents the interaction of 4-EBP with um, eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, so therefore the functional cat forms. It's worth noting that in insulin via the tyrosine kinase receptor activates MAP kinase and mTOR, and therefore is actually um, responsible in an upstream sense uh, for the serine phosphorylation of 4-EBP. Um, and this leads to 40S subunits being recruited and translation initiated. And this actually is the mechanism under uh, that is responsible for glycogen synthase, uh, um, the, the effects of glycogen synthase. The experimental evidence of this is knockout mice for 4-EBP have altered mechanism, uh, metabolisms because of the altered 4-EBP um, phosphorylation mechanisms. 
And this leads to a hypersensitivity to a high fat diet. In terms of clinical relevance, rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor, increases as an immunosuppressant for um, coating coronary stents and also preventing organ transplant rejection. So now onto elongation. Translation has uh, begun as uh, just detailed previously in the initiation step. An initiator tRNA has met has um, methionine in the P site. Um, and initially, the new uh, tRNA is only partially bound to the A site, owing to the binding of um, elongation factor 1 alpha and GTP. Complementary base pairing occurs with the recognition of codons, um, and elongation factor 1 alpha hydrolyzes GTP, which allows a peptide bond to form by peptidyl transferase between the C terminal and pe polypeptide chain of, P site, of the P site and the AA. Uh, and, and of the and the um, amino acid of the uh, A site tRNA, the P site now has no uh, amino acids, so the GTP bound elongation factor two binds the A site, which leads to G a GTP hydrolysis and ultimately a ribosomal conformational change, leading to the E site tRNA being pushed out, um, and there's a sort of a to P site movement that moves the mRNA3 nucleotides along and therefore translocation occurs and allows the um, new um, amino acid tRNA to bind. So in terms of termination, the next step of um, translation, if the ribosome encounters a stop codon, uh, you, which can be UAA, UAG, or UGA, and there is no tRNA with a complementary anticodon. So therefore, the release factor, elongation release factor um, one, recognizes the stop codon and alongside ERF3 binds to the ribosome, rib ribosome sorry, and forces peptidyl transferase add water to hydrolyze water to the peptide chain instead of um, amino acid, freeing the polypeptide by hydrolysis and releasing it from the um, ribosome. Uh, it's worth noting that polyribosomes exist, um, leading to multiple initiations on mRNA simultaneously, and the next mRNA is immediately threaded through the um, ribosome. So therefore, mRNA circularize, and this increases the local concentration of ribosomal subunits at the five prime cap, which again increases the efficiency of um, translation. The clinical relevance of um, translation more generally, and sort of this process of ribosome um, ribosomal influence on translation is that increased rates of ribosomal synthesis and increased nucleolus size um, lead to um, ribosomal DNA that is unstable as oncogenes upregulate um, rRNA transcription. And therefore, RNA pol one inhibitors are a potential anti-cancer therapy linking back to the um, different uh, uses of the polymerases at the start of the lecture. So how is translation regulated? So um, regulate, there's firstly regulation by phosphorylation of 4 bps as I mentioned above, and there is uh, the regulation of sequences present in uh, mRNA templates, um, specifically um, UTRs, untranslated um, uh, regions, and they act as a sort of regulatory target. So an example of this control is um, intracellular iron control um, with serum transferrin where a transferrin receptor is transported by a cell um, using receptor-mediated endocytosis. And high levels of ion, ion lead to um, conformational changes in ion-responsive proteins, IRPs, which lead to um, no mRNA binding to the IRE stem loops of the five prime UTRs. So um, increased uh, fer ferritin uh, storage protein, FER, translation occurs. And on the flip side, if there are low levels of iron, um, there's no conformational change um, in the IRPs. And so the IRPs bind to the mRNA's IRE stem loops. This leads to a decrease um, translation of um, ferritin, um, storage protein, FER. And therefore, this loop prevents the um, high levels of, prevents excessively high levels of iron and that's sort of interesting the iron regulation. And this is all really based on the um, principles of regulation of translation. Um, additionally, there is a third process, which is um, nonsense mediated decay, where after slicing, each exon has an exon junction complex with um, proteins attached. 
And if the exon junction complex is present downstream of a stop codon, mRNA is um, found to be faulty um, as a frame shift mutation and it is therefore degraded. Um, so this is similar to actually previously, but um, it's again a detection method for frame shift mutations. Additionally, um, a small interfering siRNAs and mRNAs bind to the three prime uh, UTRs on untranslated regions, and they act as a sort of guide for RNA-induced silencing complex risks, um, to which then lead to the degradation of um, mRNA, and also miRNA degrades can also degrade the um, RNA, and therefore, in terms of clinical applications of this. RNA interference therapies um, for Huntington's deliver miRNAs via um, adenovirus associated vectors to silence the Huntington, uh, the HTT mRNA. Um, and this is a form of sort of um, treatment, uh, treatment based on post translational regulation um, and post transcriptional regulation. In terms of antibiotics, the knowledge of the translation process can be used in antibiotic mechanisms. So we'll start with tetracyclines. So tetracyclines bind to the 30S subunit of um, bacterial ribosomes, and this blocks the ribosome docking site of the tRNA. If we go back to the um, schematic on the previous slide, uh, you'll be able to see that. Um, the, and thus the different ribosomes in prokaryotes and eukaryotes can be exploited for the specific treatment of antibiotics in preventing Translation. So aminoglycosides um, change the 30S um, subunit shape, meaning that mRNA is misread in bacteria. And finally, chloramphenicol inhibits peptide bond uh, formation. So really, e at each step, um, there can be um, sort of modulation, which can be useful in antibiotics. So once you've translated a protein, obviously protein targeting is highly important. So for protein secretion must be important to the endoplasmic reticulum first. And the signal uh, hypothesis states that cells utilize signal sequences in polypeptides to transport them to specific um, intracellular destinations, sort of like an address on a post, uh, postage sort of parcel, uh, wh wh which is then cleaned, uh, cleaved um, later. And there, there are sort of um, stretches of hydrophobic residues for polypeptides going within or through membranes. Um, for instance, there are N-terminal leader peptides which direct proteins to the um, endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And experimental evidence for signal sequences is that um, in vitro mRNA of secretory proteins um, is translated is it was translated with no microsomes, and microsomes are um, endoplasmic reticulum fragments. And these are observed to produce um, larger peptides than uh, with microsomes. And this is um, um, accounted for by the, uh, the fact that signaling sequences were not cleaved because of the absence of microsomes. And this is quite a nice, elegant experiment to include in your essays um, for the, the evidence for the signal hypothesis. Um, in terms of translocation into the ER, this is also an important mechanism and where signal sequences sort of emerge from the ribosome as it, it sort of has been translated. SRPs or signal recognition particles bind to this um, translated polypeptide and an SRP uh, ribosome complex forms and binds to the SRP receptor in the endoplasmic reticulum and this leads to the polypeptide after it's being synthesized passing through the translocon uh, following the recognition of the signal peptide and into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen um, after this, this N-terminal uh, leader peptide signal, uh, signaling peptide is cleaved and the protein is folded. So that's our final process. Um, uh, so in terms of acknowledgements of sources, unless otherwise stated, the diagrams in this PowerPoint were um, created with um, BioRender or drawn digitally um, on Notability. Um, thank you for listening. If you have any queries, feel free to email me with um, your query or, um, and please do fill in the feedback form in the link provided to receive a copy of the lecture slides and four extra multiple choice questions. Best of luck with your exams. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Gautam.